Thank you for joining our church online. We encourage you to visit citylightla.church for our service times, location, and upcoming events. If you enjoy our videos and would like to give to lives being changed in Los Angeles, visit citylightla.church slash give. We are going to be in Romans chapter 11 and Romans chapter 12. So we're going to look at one verse in Romans chapter 11, and we're going to look at a couple verses in Romans chapter 12. We are starting, uh, kicking off today, a series that we're calling Be Multiplied. It's just going to be a couple weeks. We're doing this uh, leading up to the launch of what we're calling our multiplication pipeline. You heard Jared speak about that just a couple minutes ago. You may have heard us talk about that over the last couple weeks. The multiplication pipeline is just simply a resource that we want to put in front of you to help you live a life called discipleship. And so today we're going to look a little bit at scripture and see what discipleship is. So I think in this passage of scripture, we get a little bit of an idea of what's at the heart of discipleship. Because one thing that we found as we were going through the launch of this multiplication pipeline and gathering the resources and having interest meetings and talking to um, the coaches that we're going to have um, kind of lead this first round of it is Pastor Alberto asked the question, hey, what is discipleship? If I asked you that question, what is discipleship? We had many different answers. We had different answers. It was a curriculum. It's a book. It's a mentorship. Now, all those may not be wrong answers, but that's not what encapsulates discipleship. That's not what discipleship is. Discipleship is a continual journey that will never end in your Christian life. And so we want to look at what the Bible would say what discipleship is. So we're going to do that today. We're going to be in Romans chapter 11, verse 36, and then Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. But before we get into that, I want to lay a little bit of context of what's happening here in the book of Romans, because we're diving in at the latter half of the book. So the Romans 16 chapters, we're picking up at the very end of chapter 11. So I want you guys to understand what the context is happening here, just to lay a little bit of foundation so we can pick up from there. So the Romans is written by the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul is, um, he is in Corinth at this time. He's actually not in Rome. And in fact, he had never been to Rome at this point um, for this church. He didn't plant this church. He's never met these folks. He's simply writing a letter to them from Corinth. He was in Corinth collecting up an offering. If you read through the book of Corinthians, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, you'll see that he's collecting up an offering to take to the church of Jerusalem because the church of Jerusalem is facing persecution and they're just facing a really tough time. So they take, got this offering. Now he's at a crossroads. Do I go to Rome? My heart always longs to go to Rome. We see that in all of Paul's writings. Or do I take this offering over to Jerusalem? So he goes and he takes this offering to Jerusalem and instead pens this letter. And many scholars believe that this letter is Paul's crowning achievement of the New Testament. This is, this is a, a culmination. This is Paul's argument. This is Paul's explanation of the gospel and how the gospel should be lived out. So if you want a great study, this is a great study for you to look into. It is a, an amazing book. In chapters 1 and 3 of Romans, we see that Paul is highlighting sin. First, in chapter 1, he highlights the sin of the Gentiles. And then he goes on to highlight the sin of the Jews in chapter 2, because the church at Rome was broken up between Gentiles and Jews. And then in chapter 3, he just says, you know what, I'm going to sum it all up. Everybody has sinned. For all have fallen short of the, story of the glory of God. And then in chapter 4, he explains salvation through faith. He explains the fact that you are sinners and the only way to atone to, for your sin is to pay, place your faith in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. You cannot work your way to heaven. There's, you're, with, when you're up there and on Judgment Day, the scales, you can't get the scales to tip. Salvation is through Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone, we see in chapter 4. Verses, or chapter 5 through 8, we see what comes through salvation. We see the freedom that we get in salvation, the freedom from sin, the fact that we don't have to sin no more. We see that we are no longer saved. We see that we are, there's no longer condemnation for us as those who believe in Jesus Christ. We see the joy that comes from salvation. We see the, inter, the internal security. All that's laid out in chapter 5 through 8. And then in chapters 9 through 11, he begins to address the people of Israel in particular. 
And he begins to uh, talk to them about the promises that God had given to them through Abraham. And the fact that he's going to continue to fulfill those promises through his new covenant. But because they had rejected, they were people that rejected God. He, the, the Gentiles are now able to take place in this work of salvation. We see that in 9 through 11. And then we get to the closing four chapters, chapters 12 through 16. And you're going to see this woven in and out all through the New Testament, specifically in Paul's writings. It turns to practical obedience. So he lays this huge foundation of doctrine. Hey, you're sinners. Here's salvation. This is what salvation does for you. Here's the covenant that I made, the promise I made to Abraham. And here's how I'm going to fulfill it. But it's got to come out in your living. We've seen that through our last few studies and through our study in our sermon series of 1 Thessalonians. We've seen that same theme. As we went through Titus, we've seen that same theme. Even last week, when Jared taught through 2 Corinthians, we've seen that same theme. So what God is trying to get through our heads here over and over and over is it's not just enough to have the knowledge in here. It's not just enough about information. It's also about transformation. Amen. And so that leads me to our big idea for today. And our big idea is the heart of discipleship is about making God known. So the context of here is Paul's writing to a local church. He's writing to the church at Rome. So he's saying this is what a local church should do. And through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Paul penned this. God also preserved this to this present day. So this is applicable for City Light. This is what a local church should do. Because of this doctrine that was just laid out for 11 chapters, now it should come out this way in our discipleship. So then we have to ask ourselves this question. So then, if that's the heart of discipleship, the heart of discipleship is about making God known, how do I make God known? Well, I think our text is going to explain that to us. So let's pick it up. Chapter 11, verse 36. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Chapter 12. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So the first point I want to pull out of this text for us, if at the heart of discipleship is making God known, how do we do that? Number one, by glory giving. Number one, by glory giving. So if we pick back up in verse 36, it says, For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. The first thing I want to draw us our attention to is the word for in this passage. This word for is a clausal word. You can actually probably replace this word for with the word because. Because what's happening here is Paul just laid out 11 chapters of doctrine. We just talked about it. I just walked you through what those doctrines were that he's laying out. And it's almost as Paul saying, you know what? Because of all this doctrine, because of all this stuff that God has done, I need to stop and I need to praise him. And we see that in verses 33, the previous verses before. So that word for, because, is drawing our attention back to these previous verses. In verse 33, oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom of God, and, or the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? And our answer to that would be? No one. No one. Thank you. One person. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? No one. Or who has given the gift to him that he might be repaid? No one. And this is true because from him and through him and to him are all things. So in other words, the reason why we give God glory is because everything that's ever existed is from God. There's not one thing on this earth that is here that is not from God. If something makes something, God made that. 
So why do we give God praise? Why is he the one, the only one that we sing about that says, you're the only one deserves praise? Because everything is here, including you, because of God. So therefore, nothing else is worthy of glory and praise except for God. And then it goes on. So we're, we're going to look at a few different pronouns. If you guys don't know what pronouns are, I know you guys have been out of school for quite some time. Pronouns are the hymns in there. We see, four, we see the word him in there four times. From him, so we just talked about that, everything that's ever existed is from God. And through him. So not only are you here because of God, and everything is here because of God, everything continues to be here, and you continue to be here, not because you're smart enough, not because you're smart or, or safe enough, not because you're brilliant, but because God sustains you. Period. Through him. We get this idea that we're keeping ourselves safe. Or that we need the glory. No. It's about God. The who of the glory here at City Light is God and God alone. And then it goes on and says, and to him. So not only was everything created by him and everything sustained through him, but the goal of it all is to him. Everything was created. Everything is sustained. Everything is kept here. Why? Because the goal is God, to glorify God, to bring everything to him. And we see that in the next passage, to him be glory forever. And that's what Paul did in the previous verses. He laid out 11 chapters of, of, of doctrine. And then he says, you know what? I just got to praise God. It's a culmination of everything. And that's what we do here on a Sunday. Do you know that? We gather here on a Sunday as a culmination of how good God's been to you all week long. And then we bring it here together to give him glory and to ascribe worth to him. The point of verse 36 is there's only one who deserves our glory, and that's God. So then, what does glory mean? It's a question we'll have to ask ourselves, right? So if, we, if the heart of discipleship is to make God known, one of those ways that we make God known is by giving him glory. What does that even mean? We hear it all the time, right? We'll, we'll see, uh, the, there was UFC fights last night. I don't know if you guys watch UFC fights. But oftentimes after the end of sporting events, they'll interview different athletes. And they'll say, oh, I just want to first give glory to God. Okay. Thank you, Steph Curry. What does that mean? What does that mean? It's a question you got to ask ourselves. Well, if we look at scripture for the answer of that, every time you see God's glory, it's a manifestation of God's awesomeness. It's a manifestation of how amazing our God is. So therefore, if we're to give glory to God, it's got to be a manifestation of God's awesomeness through your life. It's us, like I just said, coming together as a church family, saying God's been so good all week long. We're just going to give him praise and glory because he's awesome and he's amazing. Listen, we are the people of God. We get to see God's working in our lives every single day. We get to discern this book because we are people of God. You get to see God's power. You get to see God's faithfulness. You get to see God's goodness play out in your life every single day. And glory is just you displaying that awesomeness of his. Coming together and saying, you know what? At the heart of my discipleship, I just want to make God look awesome. I want the world to be in awe of my God. Because of how good he is. And how amazing he is. And that's what Paul's saying here. He's saying, you know what, Church of Rome? You know what, Church City Light? 
This is something that you need to unify around. Whether Jew or Gentile or Roman or Greek, whatever it is, you need to unify around the fact that we are here for one person and one person only. We're not here to glorify Josh Porter. We're not here to glorify Nick Reed. We're not here to glorify Alberto Portillo. We're not here to glorify this land. We're here to glorify Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. That's what we're here for. Is that what you're here for? It's an inventory time. Answer that question. Is that what you're here for? If you're not a Christian yet, maybe that's, maybe that's not talking to you. If you are a Christian, is that why you're here? I see so many people come in and out of the church because they came for the wrong reasons. They come searching for a spouse. They come searching to sell their Amway. They come... For whatever reason, God fix all my problems. And when it doesn't happen, they're out just as quick as they came in. Check yourself and make sure you're here for the right reasons. As a Christian, we're here to glorify God and make him known. It's about him. Colossians chapter 1 says that he needs to have the preeminence. You know, sometimes, and, I, and, and I'm guilty of this, I think we ask ourselves the wrong questions. And you've probably even seen it in your life group handout questions that I, that I make, okay? <laughs> and we often say something like this, well, what would you get out of today's service? Hey, what would you get out of the meeting? What would you get out of life group? And probably the more appropriate question is, what did God get out of our service? What did God get out of your life group? Was he glorified? Or did we just get together and make ourselves feel good or get together and gossip in our life groups? Or was God glorified? It's about him. It's about him. So if you see that question in your life group handouts again, let me know. <laughs> the second thing I see here, okay, if discipleship is about making God known, we do that how? Number one, by glory giving. Number two, by gospel living. By gospel living. So we talked about... The fact that Paul's writings always end with this fact that it needs to come out in practical obedience. Okay, we don't come here just to make ourselves intellectual Christians up here. We come for it to change our hearts here and allow it to live out as we go out into our community. And we see that here in the text. If we pick up in chapter 12, verse 1, it says, I appeal to you, therefore... So I'm going to start with that word appeal. That, that word appeal is almost like I'm, I'm commanding you. If you. Maybe you have a King James copy of the Bible. It says, I beseech you. I'm appealing you. I'm commanding you. I'm asking you. I'm begging you. Because of everything that you've just heard. Because of everything that I laid out. I'm begging you. I'm commanding you. By the mercies of God. To present your body as a living sacrifice. Hey, I'm begging you because of what God did, because of the 11 chapters that I just displayed God's goodness and his doctrine and how he saved you and he rescued you from your sin and now how you're free and you're adopted unto him. I'm begging you now to present your body as a living sacrifice to him because he's worthy of it all. And I, I, I want to point you how this puts us still in the gospel. You said gospel living, Josh. Well, we're still in the gospel here. How are we still in the gospel? It's that word, therefore. Whenever you see the word, therefore, in the Bible, it should point you which direction? Forward or back? Backward. Okay, this will help you in your Bible study. If you see a word, therefore, in Scripture, it's pointing you backwards to the previous supporting Scripture. So in this case, he's saying... I appeal to you, therefore. 
So because of everything that I said, therefore do this. Okay? So that therefore is keeping us in the gospel because that's what he just explained for 11 chapters. Okay? So you, you got to remember, some, this is what we do sometimes in our Bible reading. Okay? We read chapter 11 and we say, okay, done. Now chapter 12. But remember, this is a letter. Okay? The chapters, the verses, those, those, aren't, those aren't inspired by, by God. Okay? This was a letter. I don't know if, you, if you've ever written a letter or you've written a love letter to someone. You don't write down, okay, now chapter 2, chapter 12. No, this is a letter. Okay? The scribes put in the chapters and the verses and all that stuff to help us as we read it. Okay, so you've got to read it together as a whole. Okay, so it's not chapter 11 and then stop. No, it's a continuation. I appeal to you, therefore, pulling you back into the gospel. So because of the gospel, because of what God's done, because of what God's given to you, present your bodies a living sacrifice. So essentially it's saying, you know what, God, I'm available. Here's my body. You want my mouth? Here it is. You want my feet? You want my hands? You want me to serve you? In which way? I'm ready. Here I am. We don't pass an offering plate here, but if an offering plate were passed by, it's like putting your whole body in that offering plate. You say, you know what, I'm, I'm here. And it's a living sacrifice. This is a direct contrast to what they would have known in the Old Testament as animal sacrifices. So animal sacrifices, you see in the Old Testament, what they would do is they would take an animal, a spotless animal, they would build an altar, put a bunch of wood on the altar, put the animal there, and then light the altar on fire. The animal would burn up, the smoke would go up into the heavens, and God would either accept it as a savoring odor, a beautiful odor, or he would reject it as something disgusting. And the only difference between the two was the condition of the person's heart that lit it on fire. And it's all pointing to Jesus Christ, by the way. He is the ultimate sacrifice. And so our response to the gospel, our response to all of this, is just to present our bodies a living sacrifice. Saying we're available, we're here for your work, Lord. And then it says, just holy and acceptable to God. When I read that, I say, you know what? How hard do I have to work to be holy and acceptable to God? Man, what, what more do I have to do to make myself holy and acceptable to God? And then God tries to slap you on the face sometimes when you read the Bible and slaps you around and he says, hey, this is gospel living. You don't have to do anything. You're already holy and acceptable because of Jesus Christ. Because of his finished work, because of his perfect blood that was shed on Mount Calvary, you are holy and acceptable already. So you don't have to wait to clean yourself up to start living this way. That's the whole point. Sometimes we, we think like, I, I can't do this. I've, I've got to get my act together before I can live for Christ. No one wants to follow me and be a disciple of me because I'm all jacked up. Hey, we're all jacked up. That's the point of the gospel. The point of the gospel is that we are sinners and there's nothing that we could do to work our way out of it. That's why Jesus had to come in the first place. So all you have to do is present yourself to him and allow him to work through your life. You say, okay. How do I do that? Well, let's continue on in the passage. It says, do not be conformed to this world. What does that mean? Do not be conformed to this world. It means don't be molded into the ideologies we see in our present age. Th that's what that means. It's like putting yourself in a mold to what's happening in the present age. So for them in Rome, it would have been what's happening in their present age. Don't be like this. It's not necessarily, here's the world's standards of rules. Here's Christianity's standards of rules. And you stay right here. It's more of, hey, what's happening in your day and age right now in the world? 
Don't be conformed to that mold and that image, but instead be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So how do you be transformed by the renewing of your mind? It's right here. This book. So if you don't want to be conformed to the way this world is, you got to be right here. And when I look at our present age and I look at what this world is trying to do to us, one thing that blatantly sticks out to me that we have to avoid as Christians is this world is trying to get us to hate each other. On any division they can find. Political differences, skin color, music we sing, you pick it. The sports team that you like, we hate Giants fans around here, sorry Ken. Actually, I, I should be thanking Ken and thanking Kylan. Do you guys know, yesterday, around noon, I called them and I said, you know what? I need to change my whole outline. I said, I, 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 said, I think God wants me to preach something else. Programs have already been printed. Slides have already been done. And those two graciously said, preach what God wants you to preach. We'll take care of it. So, thankful for them for allowing me to fall follow God's lead. But by the way, we still hate Giants fans. <laughs> but in all seriousness, the world is trying to pull us apart and put, it, put us at each other's throats. Listen, as people of God, we are not marked by hate, we are marked by love. That is what the Bible says, how the world will know that we are disciples of Christ, is how we love one another. So if you're finding yourself hating other people for any reason, you are being conformed to this world. So what you need to do to get out of that is you need to renew your mind. How do you renew your mind? You get in this book. That is why we have multiplication pipeline. Not that that's the end all be all of discipleship, but that is to help you get in the book. That's why we open up the book every Sunday. That's why we have life groups to talk about the book. That's why we have summer studies. They're all resources to get you here. Because this is where the change happens. Is this book. Look at it. What, we are going to be tested every single day. Read, let's, let's continue on. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. You are going to walk into a test every single day. Every single day. When you go to work and the co-worker is nagging or you watch yourself work harder than the co-worker and they get the promotion. When you open up your social media and you see a comment you disagree with, and you just want to get in the chat real quick. <laughs> when you're living alone with your spouse and they're irritating you, and the kids aren't listening, it's a testing every single day of if your mind's being renewed. And the only way you're going to know how to respond to those situations and pass the test by reading the book when you went to school, you got a book, and inside the book was the information to pass the test. It's the same thing. You have a test every single day according to this passage. Are you passing? Hey, it's an open book test. All you have to do is open it up. Us, us as pastors, we're going to get up and try to, try to teach it. But it's your job to take notes, review it. Hey, I don't know what, let, let, me, let me test to see if Josh said was correct. Go test it. We encourage you to. We want you to. Why? Because we want you to pass the test. And why do we want you to pass the test? Because it points everyone to the awesomeness and glory of God when we do. Not so you can win an argument on Facebook. 
But so you can see how to respond and point a lost and dying world to the amazing Savior. That's the point. That's the point of discipleship. It's an open book test. I made a joke in the earlier service. I, I, I went to college after the military. I used my GI Bill. What, what? <laughs> but anyway, I, I'm terrible at math. Like, terrible. And so I, I would go home, and I'd have math homework, and I'd try to get my wife to explain it to me. And it started out with her trying to explain it to me, and it just ended in a fight. Every time. It's like, no, that's not how you do it. You're dumb. She's like, well, you're the dumb one trying to ask me for homework help and yada, yada, yada. So what we ended up doing is deciding on the fact that she would do my homework. <laughs> and I would just fail the tests. And the two would even out and I would pass. <laughs> we don't have to do <laughs> it's Confessions, good for the soul. <laughs> we don't have to do that, church. You don't have to have someone else do your homework. Okay? You have the book. Hey, when the devil comes knocking on their shoulder, he's not going to ask you, he's not going to wait for you to go ask the pastor for the answer. You got to know the book. Hey, I'm faced with this tough situation. Hey, can you hold on one sec? I don't know how to respond. Let me go text Pastor Alberto. No, 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 no. You've got the same Holy Spirit in you as I do. As Nick Reed does, as Alberto does, you can discern and open up this book and know how to live just like we do. So the question is, how are you doing with all that? I know I'm not doing great all the time. So it leads us to our live to learn. Because here we want to not just come and open the book, and get it for an intellectual gathering. But we want to come get that intellectual information and allow it to transform our lives and we live it out. So we always end with what we call live to learn. So we got three of them today. Let me get to them. I didn't even use these notes. Number one, do you know the one who deserves the glory? Are you here, and you don't even know what I'm talking about with the salvation stuff that I mentioned? You don't know the risen Savior? Why should I glorify him? I don't even know who he is. Let me tell you a little bit about him. Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. Jesus Christ came because like what we talked about, you are what the Bible calls a sinner. Everyone has fallen short of the glory of God. The Bible says that no one is righteous, no, not one. It means that you've broken God's commands. It could be something simple as telling a lie, stealing something. We've all been there. You didn't have to teach your kids how to sin. God came in the flesh in Jesus Christ to atone for that sin. There's nothing you can do on your own. Like I said before, the scales are never going to tip in heaven saying your good outweighs your bad. It will never happen. The only way you're getting to heaven is through the person of Jesus Christ. And you need to put your faith in him and him alone. It's not him plus doing good things. It's not him plus baptism. It's not him plus my good works. It's him and him alone. First John says that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Have you put your faith in Jesus Christ today? If you haven't, you can do that today. It'd be the greatest decision you ever make in your life. I would love you to talk to me, talk to Sam, Jared, Alberto. Come to us after service if you want to make that decision. We will open up the Word of God and show you what the Bible says about it. Not my opinion, not his opinion. I'll show you what the Bible says about it. And how you can know 100% that you have a home in heaven through the person of Jesus Christ. Number two, are you being conformed to the world or transformed by Christ? 
Look at the tests you've been given. How are you responding to those tests? Are you responding in hatred and anger? You may be a little bit closer to the world. You may need to slide back over and get in the book. See how Jesus would respond. Last one. Is your life showing the glory of God to a lost world? Does your life represent the awesomeness that is Christ? Because I tell you, my friends, he is awesome. As they used to say in old sports center stuff, they're like, if you don't think God is awesome, you need awesome lessons. Because God is amazing. And you've seen it in your life. Is that showing to a lost and dying world? Do they want to see God because they're seeing you? Or are we turning people away from God because we're acting contrary to the way that his awesomeness? It's questions we got to ask ourselves as we leave today. Will you pray with me? Father, Lord, we thank you so much for how good you are.